The idea is that we were going to sell local coupons. So you would check into places and get, you know, local ads. And then I think in my best case projection, we'd have 2 million users after three years. This is Reverse Engineer. On this show, we'll be talking to some of the most successful founders in the world and searching for the answers to why their businesses work. What were the key secrets, the decisions, the wins and the heartbreaks that got them where they are today? Plus, at the very end, I'll give you a chance to get your questions answered as well. Now, we have a very special guest. Let's roll the tape. Instagram has a bunch of new filters. And I can share photos with you on Instagram and you can share your photos with me. Facebook just announced that they're buying Instagram for about a billion dollars. How much time do you spend per day on Instagram? Instagram was created as this instant thing, yeah. but it's become this real focus of uh, people's lives. Instagram, from two founders working on their laptops to over a billion people using it in less than a decade. Athletes, comedians, fashion icons, The Rock, The Pope, Instagram is one of the most powerful platforms out there. Today, we have Mike Krieger, co-founder of Instagram, to reverse engineer how Instagram went from just an idea to something you and I use every single day. From their secret business plan to some super controversial decisions to answers to questions we have always wanted to know, Mike reveals all. Welcome to Reverse Engineered. Let's get started. Mike, thank you here for being with us. Honored to be your first guest. Start off with the Mike Krieger origin story. What was your first childhood memory of working with computers or trying to build something? So I was born in, in Sao Paulo, so I grew up in Brazil. And I was lucky, my dad brought home a computer, I think I was maybe four or five. I remember a couple of things. I remember the game Prince of Persia and loving that. And then the other thing I remember is uh, a lot of the games that came with this computer, this is like MS-DOS, right? Uh, were written in QBasic. I was uh, poking around, I was like, oh, you can look at the code for this. And all I could do at the time was break it. But uh, it was kind of this early glimpse into how things worked on computers. Back then, did you think of building your own company, being a technology founder? Was it even something that you dreamed of? Uh, not exactly. So I was growing up in Brazil and there wasn't really anybody I was exposed to or got to see that was like, oh, this is what it's like to build a company uh, in tech. So, it, you know, for the longest time, I saw this as a really fun thing that I would play around with during summers and on the weekends and at night. And I hadn't quite drawn the dots between that and founder of a company. That is a notion that people who build technology companies have to have computer science degrees. Neither knew nor Kevin actually studied computer science. I like to say that both Kevin and I knew enough about computer science or engineering to be dangerous, uh, but not enough to, you know, maybe trip over ourselves by knowing too much. I think that was kind of an optimal amount. So my degree was in symbolic systems. You know, I arrived at Stanford and got settled in. They had, you know, speakers come in who were alumni who, you know, were willing to come in and have dinner with a, a set of students. And I walked away feeling like these people have accomplished something amazing, but they're just people like there aren't these like other species called entrepreneurs that you know build these things they're you know folks that had you know an idea and and a good team and, and went out and did things so that was really a turning point for me to start being able to see myself uh, as one of those founders eventually this the origin story of you and Kevin on Instagram actually starts with an app called bourbon walk us through you know those few months from meeting Kevin Bourbon, what was all that like? I was thinking about a lot of different things around mobile and the, the iPhone was launching, you know, I built iPhone apps with my friends on the weekends, but nothing particularly huge. Uh, I was spending my weekends at this place called Coffee Bar. I would, you know, bring my laptop there and just build. I was trying to learn mobile uh, development. I was trying to try out ideas. While doing that, I would see, you know, somebody I vaguely knew from college, who was Kevin, who eventually became my co-founder. And we got to talking and I was like, hey, I'm working on these projects. He was working on something called Bourbon, which is B-U-R-B-N. Pretty quickly, I started using it. And I got excited about the product because everybody else at the time was focusing on these check-ins and they were very textual, like, I'm here. And Bourbon had this ability to add photos and videos. A couple of months later, Kev decided to do this for real, take the leap, leave the startup he was working at, raise money. We reconnected. I was already using the product. I was into it. I had basically volunteered to work on it for free if he wanted, you know, another coder on the weekends. And that was a moment where, you know, making that leap felt really big in some ways, but also really natural. 
one of the stories that Kevin tells about this era is he convinces you we're going to go build this photo sharing app and by the way we need to figure out what that means for your visa what did that time feel like i talked to kevin i told him like i like what you're doing i'd like to join up and uh i worked with this lawyer to approve the new h1b and it's funny when you actually write out what a company is on paper before you really launch it's some financing and maybe a plan maybe a prototype and it doesn't look quite legitimate yet so we got you know it's known as a request for evidence and they were like all right you know this business sounds a little sketchy but you know if you just chose the business plan that you sent your investors you know maybe we'll understand better about the business of course we had no business plan at all so i spent this furious weekend writing out a business plan for what bourbon could be i found this recently actually the idea is that we were going to sell local coupons so you would check into places and get you know local ads and then i think in my best case projection we'd have 2 million users after 3 years and we sent that off and it just took a long time and at one point i remember turning to kevin and saying look i will totally understand if you'd rather find somebody who doesn't have a visa issue you know every month really counts when you're doing a startup i'm internally grateful to him for saying you know i really want to work with you let's figure this out but we did finally get that cleared through and then i was able to finally jump in and and get started Bourbon is out there in the wild. You and Kevin decide to double down and focus just on photos. Why? So with Bourbon, we had something that you know about a hundred people really liked. It was friends, family, and one guy in Hawaii. So we decided to sort of knock out some of the reasons why more people weren't using it. Maybe it just doesn't have enough features. Which is really, as a founder, if you ever hear yourself asking that question or saying that out loud, you are almost certainly wrong. Product market fit never comes from being n plus one. But we fell into that trap. So we spent you know another month or two building more features into Bourbon, and it had a leaderboard and gamification and plans. You could make plans with friends. It really did. Did a lot. We finally realized like it wasn't more; it was less that we needed. And let's figure out what people actually like about this product. And the core of it was really the photos piece. They were using the app to post photos of what they were doing on the weekends. Again, to a small audience, but they were excited about that. And the pivot, as it were, was saying, "Could we just do that, but make that incredible?" The few product decisions I think that you folks made around the time, which you know, probably some of the most amazing in the history of the industry. The first one is around filters and how they made photos look good. The second one is doing the background upload. Could you describe what that was and how that actually mattered? For us, the core Instagram problems that we were going after were photos don't look that good. That's where filters came in. Step two was, man, it is really slow to upload photos in every other app we've tried. They were basically waiting until everything was all ready to upload with. The caption and the tags and the sharing options, and then when the the person hit done, start the upload. And the networks at the time were not great. So what can we do to make it faster? You know, without actually having the ability to upgrade three G networks, we did things like this background uploading, where we, as soon as you were done filtering your photo, that's the photo. You're not going to edit it any further. So while you were filling out your caption and then you were choosing your location, etc., we were uploading in the background. And by the time you hit done. Boom! All you had to upload that one was a string or two of text of, of your caption, and it was really fast. Every step, you know, you took about the time that you wanted it to take, and no longer. So that was a really key component, I think, of our early sort of snappiness and and feeling that this was really a new experience that you could have on your phone. I think now we come to the moment when most people, at least in the tech industry, first heard of you. Where there is a blog post out on TechCrunch talking about Instagram, and almost instantly it was clear this is going to be a thing. How did that feel like going from something which was tightly held to suddenly being a thing? There are two main feelings or emotions there. One was like total panic because a lot broke when we launched. You know, there was like a litany of things that brought us down on day one. The blessing in disguise of that was the first few days I had no time to really reflect on. Hey, this thing is interesting and cool to more than just the two of us. The whole feeling I had was just like, oh man, did we blow it? Like we finally got something done, and now everybody is just seeing error pages. Then once we came up for air, and I remember this moment, it was maybe half a week in. We pulled an all nighter. We migrated to AWS. The site was working. It was like four or five a.m. Took an Uber to one place, and I had to take the metro the rest of the way. And I remember getting on the Muni, and there was somebody using Instagram, and I was like, oh, this. This, oh, people are using this outside of you know our heads or outside of the fact that there were errors on the database and little moments like that really started just making it sink in. Like, oh, this is something that has legs and people are using and really enjoying. 
I think a lot of founders are going to be watching this. Founders who have the spark of something working. What advice would you have for people in that position? I think one of the pieces that we really did well and ended up being a philosophy for us for years, actually was the kind of founding philosophy of our engineering and our product team, was this idea of doing the simple thing first. You can really see it in Instagram, you know, the first few months, like uh, we didn't really put that much time into figuring out like, well, what happens when this app gets a lot of usage? For example, comments, V1 of Instagram didn't get collapsed. So if there were a hundred comments on a photo, we showed you a hundred comments in feed. You know, most people are gonna have follower counts in the like, hundreds, maybe thousands if they're fairly big. And then, you know, you, for, you have your first person blow up, you know, I think Snoop Dogg joined. Snoop Dogg had, I don't know, 10,000 followers. Maybe, you know, the UI didn't support that many digits. And it's like, I think you have to be okay with some of that. And then you fix it once you realize it. But one of the core pieces of advice was really building for the problems you know you have and not get so caught up in the, well, once we have a million people using the site, like, how is this going to work? Now we come famously to Facebook acquiring Instagram. How did it feel in the moment? The future is really unclear at that moment. And you have to sort of trust that a lot of it is in your hands to make the situation work, whatever the situation may be. Like, do I think we could probably have worked independently? Yeah, like we would have to learn new things about building out a recruiting team and building that out and starting a sales force and monetizing. And then instead, we had to learn a lot of interesting things around how do you take this sort of pot of people, inject it into a company of thousands of engineers and have that thrive, which is itself a set of really interesting lessons. Controversial product changes and launches over Instagram time. Uh, the first one, and I like this a lot because I have a version of this from Twitter, is the launch of Rank P. So walk, walk us through what ranking is. We had at the very, very beginning, you know, a totally chronological feed. So you posted a photo, it showed up in people's feeds and, and it obviously has benefits, right? You know that what you're seeing is the freshest content. And I think for a purely small network where you're seeing just a handful of friends, I think that can work quite well because you as a individual are likely to consume most of your feed. What changed was one is more of your friends joined. So literally even of the stuff you wanted to see every one of, there was more and more of it other piece was accounts joining that were able to produce at a much higher volume. I use National Geographic as an example here because they had photographers all around the world posting photos of incredible places, but they could post eight photos a day. And, you know, they would probably be really high quality, great photos. But the currency of the network starts getting, you know, kind of confused when you have one producer producing eight photos a day. And if they happen to post it at the time where you happen to check your feed, they might've pushed down your friend who posted an hour ago. You might never see that one. And that was really the problem we were trying to set out to solve was people were missing stuff from their friends. And this is one of these really interesting things because the reaction when we launched it from you know a subset of folks was really strong. And you went through this at Twitter, like you know the, the trade-off is obviously control versus ranking. And for lots of folks, they said, yeah, like I, I don't like, it's unpredictable. Um, and you know, ultimately the only thing we could do is look at what problem were we setting out to solve, which was we want people to see things from their close friends. And what we saw from the stats there were like that number went through the roof. Twitter went through something very similar. Uh, when Twitter launched ranking, um, RIP Twitter started trending. And one of my favorite memories from reading some of those tweets was uh, Lynn Mandel Miranda wrote a poem you know, talking about how he was going to leave Twitter because of the algorithm. Now looking back, it was probably the single most important product innovation the company ever made. Now we get to a fun part, uh, which is the launch of stories. So walk us through the thinking behind stories and also it had to have been scary to go make such a large product change and launch it, you know, pretty much to everybody at the same time. People had felt like Instagram was becoming too high pressure. We did a ton of user research and we talked to people like, well, what do you think of as like the rules of Instagram? Or, you know, how do you think about posting? They're like, oh, you never double Insta, never. You do a single Insta a day. And you only double Insta on prom and like when you get married. And I was like, wow, okay. Like we've clearly created the optimal product for posting at most one photo a day, which is fine, but people have other moments in their lives. That's really the kind of core problem that stories set out to solve. And it didn't start as stories, like we tried so many different prototypes about what you could do to alleviate that. So one of the prototypes was, but what if you could add on to feed items? So you posted a photo, you know, maybe you did one uh, because you're starting a, a road trip or maybe it's just a hike and then you want to be able to add to it. And we did that and the work from that didn't end up in stories. It ended up in what we ended up calling multi-photo posts, which we actually launched separately because we realized 
it was solving a different problem, which was sometimes a single photo doesn't capture the moment three do, but you actually want to spend the time and filter them, et cetera. And the more feed became this sort of high quality, more pressure filled space, the less it was about the moment. And so really what we were really setting out to do with these different iterations of the products that eventually became stories was, can we help people share authentically in the moment? I think almost excluded trying to do something too uh, much like what Snap already had with stories. And then eventually realized like, no, they came up with something really smart and it is a great way of solving for this problem. So then the question becomes, how do you make it Instagram? How do you take a format that was working well and make it work even better? So we did things around the, the controls when you were going forward and backwards and pausing. And we did things around uh, our drawing tools to make them feel more like Instagram than they would have in Snapchat. And my you know, two sentence theory on social networks is they're really a combination of three things, which is format, audience, and vibe. You can have the same format with different audiences and they mean very, very different things. You might actually follow similar folks or you know, be friends with somebody on Snapchat and also follow them on Instagram, but you will still see different things from them. And I think that's a really interesting question, which is how does the platform dictate the sort of vibe of the content? And I think your creative tools and your UI and all of those have to match what you're going for there. I call this section verified by an official source or not. I'm going to run you past a few anecdotes and you get to verify it. Verified or not, you once fixed the Instagram sign when it went down in the middle of the night and didn't know that you had done it when you woke up in the morning. Yeah, I was on a trip and, uh, okay, we were in Vegas. I had a bit to drink, had a lot to drink. And the following morning I woke up and I was like, the site looks like it had an issue at like three or four in the morning. Hey Shane, did you fix it? He's like, no, I was asleep, I was fine. Press up on the terminal, you get your own history commands. And I was like, Oh yeah, I totally fixed this and I have absolutely no memory of doing this. Verified or not, if anybody watching this wants to get verified on Instagram, all they need to do is to slide into your DMs and you will do it <laughs> right away. This is one of those things that I couldn't help you when you were at when I was at Instagram and I can help you even less uh, now. But maybe I'll do a PSA. If somebody emails you asking for your password in order to get verified, please do not click on it. I cannot tell you how many friends I have had uh, fall for this particular phishing scheme, which is a really evil one because it really gets on people's like real desire to get verified and it is almost certainly a phishing attempt. I don't know whether this was you or Kevin, but is it true that one of you or both of you got to meet the Pope in person when he created his Instagram account? I think Kevin got to meet the Pope twice, but yeah, we uh, Kevin flew out there to sort of help onboard him and, and, and help him get got up and started and got the account registered and signed up. And yeah, absolute truth. Verified or not, the reason Instagram doesn't have an iPad app is because Mike Krieger hates the iPad. I still get questions about this. And sometimes people will ping me like, hey, we have this like group of like elite Mac engineers and thinkers and we're all talking about Instagram and like lack of an iPad app and wondering why, like, is it out of spite? And, uh, you know, right or wrong, for me, it was all about quality and minimizing surfaces. The number of folks that want to use it uniquely on iPad is probably not high. I'd rather spend the time to make every feature look awesome and work really well on iOS, on the phone, and then, you know, not be thinking with everything that we build, like, oh, we also have to think about this, you know, bigger screen. We also have to think about adapting it for landscape and portrait in a way that we never had to do that. So, you know, it's interesting because at some point you're, it looks, it feels a little silly to say that because you have, you know, 100 plus engineers, uh, like surely one of them could build an app and app. And yeah, and for sure, we actually built, you know, a couple of versions internally that, that worked quite well. Um, the question is less the first time and it's more around, how do you want to dedicate your energy going forward and making sure that like every experience works well on every platform? You obviously built something which is iconic and amazing. Uh, when you, uh, imagine you're looking back a few decades from now, how would you want your work with Instagram or Instagram to be thought of and remembered? I think at its best, Instagram is a way of helping you see the world differently. Like my favorite thing I ever heard from people who were using Instagram, you know, early or late days uh, was, yeah, it's like, I now see the world in a more visual way. Like a moment that I otherwise might, you know, have been distracted, I now I'm really paying attention. And I think if it's if it's remembered as a way in which it, you know, encourage people to think visually, uh, see the world in a different way and stay connected to each other, like that would that would feel really good. To reverse engineer Instagram, Mike and Kevin were the perfect co-founders and they were so lucky 
to find each other. They pivoted when they needed and they always did the simplest thing first. And they were not afraid to change the product even when it was unpopular to do so. And that's why two people with just their laptops were able to change the world in less than a decade. Now, we have something very exciting. Mike Krieger is going to try and answer some of your questions too. If you have a fun question for Mike, subscribe to the channel and drop your question in the comments below. We'll get the best ones over to Mike and get them answered as soon as we can. Till next time, thank you for watching Reverse Engineering.